Hi, I'm Simon Horner Long um, from Corn Ferry, um, and I'm here today with Sophie Bryan uh, to talk about uh, well being in the workplace. Uh, Sophie is a TEDx speaker uh, in the past and also an author. Um, and I think she, she has her own business based around this whole concept. Um, I'm going to ask Sophie to introduce herself by telling us something really interesting and personal about herself. So <laughs> thank you. Um, so I was thinking long and hard about what to say in response to this question. You gave me a little hint, didn't you, Simon, before we jumped on the call? I did. And I, I think um, the best thing I can share with you, um, I think most people are surprised about, you know, I've got a 20 years of a corporate HR culture background and now run a HR workplace consultancy, but I'm actually a burlesque dancer which ah. uh, is quite shocking, I think, to most people. Um, and I also started uh, ballet when I was 33. So for five years, I've been dancing ballet as well. So I think they're probably the two things that I would probably say most people don't know about me. Um, probably a little bit shocking, I guess, in the place of a uh, workplace culture, but heavily important when it comes to well-being. Well, it would be quite interesting, certainly, to see some burlesque dancing in the workplace. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect that might contribute to an interesting working environment. <laughs> That's the next book, Simon. <laughs> That's the next book. Okay, fair enough. On the topic of books, Sophie, you've you've recently written um, a book uh, called Breaking Barriers, uh, mm. Transformational Leadership, Stories from Pioneering Women and Men Inspiring Change. Perhaps we can start with what was the um, impetus behind the book? Mm. Well, I think there are so many leaders out there. Most of us have got a compelling story. Like what's made us the leader we are today? What's being our, our journey as being a leader? All of us have that story. Simon, you've got that story. I know Julian's got that story. We all have that story in us. And it's never an easy story. None of us have really sailed through our leadership career without any chinks, without things kind of knocking us down and us needing to be built back up. And I, I feel like this book is a way of us collecting stories that the everyday person can relate to. This isn't the, I'm the Tony Robbins, you know, of these weird and wonderful, real deep adversity. It's just really good grounded stories of people of how they have shaped their leadership and what's important to them in their leadership and how, just by being themselves and owning what happens to them and how they've shifted through that, they've become pioneering. Because I think we use that word, you know, transformational pioneering as, you know, someone who's got to be big, famous, earning millions, you know, Elon Musk's of the world. And I believe all of us have that in us. So the stories are a collection of giving transformation and pioneering a steer that the everyday person can relate to. Well, that sounds fantastic. And perhaps we can get into some of those stories as we explore the topic of, um, you know, health and well-being in the workplace. So I know I, I first encountered your, your thinking in your TED talk, which was really about bringing uh, the thinking and the philosophy behind the, the Montessori school movement mm. into the workplace. Mm. Um, and then you've written your book. And I think your book sort of picks up on, on four, four themes, broadly speaking. One is about, you know, how to have a happier uh, workplace. Mm. Uh, two is a healthier workplace. Um, three is to be, you know, more productive. Uh, and fourth is to do it all with purpose. And, and that mm. these things collectively mm. um, sort of contribute to, to health and well-being in the workplace. So perhaps I can ask you first how we or how your thinking around Montessori sort of relates to those those mm. four themes you know how did mm. your thinking evolve from yeah. Montessori and, and sorry for our listeners um, might be worth just doing a very quick recap of sort of the key mm. uh, aspects of, of Montessori that you think mm. are important to bring into the workplace. Well that's dangerous Simon asking me that question because I'm so passionate about Montessori I could <laughs> I could do a whole podcast on just that so the Montessori form of education is an alternative form of education. So it differs significantly from the standard form of education that we especially know in the UK. Um, in that 
children have a lot of freedom to make decisions about what they do during the day, what access to learning they have, what materials they use to learn. They are very much a child led organization. So you don't have teachers as such, you have guides. You won't have a teacher standing at the front of the room, commanding a room of 30 children. What you would have is a guide going around and working with pockets of children who have chosen to perhaps take the zoology tray off the shelf. And they're playing with animals and understanding the, the circle of life. And the guide will come and ask them questions, give them challenges, depending on the age of those particular children. And then when the children are finished with that, they then move on to another thing. So there, there is less structure in that respect. It's not you know, 9.30 English, 10.30 maths. Um, it plays very much to children's strengths and their intrinsic interests. But there is also an element of the teacher making sure that the child gets the well-rounded education. So if they notice that the child is always playing with math material, but isn't doing anything science-based, then it's the guide's job to help coach that child into using those materials or bring in the science into the maths so that it kind of makes sense for that child in the context in which they're working with. Um, I'll leave it there because I can go on. I can go on for a very long time on that. But to bring it back to your initial question about how I found Montessori and why it relates to the workplace and the kind of the structure of my TED talk, which was back in 2018. So when I had my daughter, I was working in a very senior HR position in workplace culture, and I needed to choose a nursery for her to go to so that I could continue my career. And I was really struggling to find the right place to send my daughter. I was like, I don't want the noise and the plasticness of typical nurseries. Um feeling very strongly about needing something alternative for her and I, I stumbled upon this Montessori nursery where as I explained in my TED talk the the children at the age of three were chopping carrots they had knives in their hands at the age of three there were children queuing at the age of four with toothbrushes and one child would be going down the line putting toothpaste on the children's toothbrushes for them to brush their teeth and in that moment I thought wow we are entrusting in this environment three-year-olds to have knives, which is kind of quite unheard of, isn't it? Like, I don't know, many <laughs> of those of you that are listening that have got children, you know, would you trust your no, three-year-old? I'm, I'm not sure as a parent that I would have given my three-year-old a knife. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But in the Montessori environment, there's such a care for teaching children how to use equipment safely before, you know, you hand them a knife to, to chop carrots. And it made me think about the workplace in terms of how can we trust three-year-olds to chop a carrot? Yet in the workplace, there is so little trust around working hours. I need to see what you're doing, how you're doing it. Um, especially in the current day where we're now seemingly seem to have forgotten that COVID happened and we're, we're pulling the reins back on people and saying to people, well, how do I know you're working if I can't see you come back to work, you know, in the office four days a week so I can monitor you and I can see your, your, um, your presence. And uh, it really made me question that because I thought, if three-year-olds can have knives, why can't we trust adults in the workplace to do their thing too? And mm. so one of the things that came up for me is very much around freedom and what freedom we have in the workplace and how we create a trusting environment where there is freedom within boundaries. So we're not just causing chaos, but we have got the ability to act using our own intelligence and our own um, knowledge to do what needs to be done rather than always having all these systems, all these structures in place, all these rigid rules around you must be logged on by 8.30 and you cannot leave your seat until 4.30 and that has to happen five days a week. Um, there's very little freedom in that. It's very rigid. And actually, there's a lot that then plays into the, the well-being piece around that for me too. Mm. So that's just I agree. one I think <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's very interesting because I think one of the things I've always railed against is a culture of presenteeism, which mm -hmm. I think yeah is what you're talking about you know you've got to be in the office and be seen to be in the office um and and there's nothing more pointless than being seen to be in the office just for the for the sake of it you know um and these days i think a lot of people spend a lot of time commuting to go into the office to get on zoom and teams calls <laughs> and struggling exactly. to find meeting rooms and private spaces to do that and you sort of wonder what the point is. So I, I'm I'm a big believer in uh, well, I know there's there's a very big debate about this, and I know there are lots of 
issues around um you know youngsters learning from their elders and mm. having you know coffee machine chats that are fortuitous and and all the rest and and um i certainly think there's a place for that but i'm a big believer in in outcomes you know mm -hmm. uh, ask people to deliver a result um and then let them get on with how how they do exactly. that which i think is what yeah. you're saying yeah which is that that's the freedom in boundaries you you set the deadline you set the budget but how everyone then creates that thing is within their gift to be able to do that in the same way that a child's given the knife to chop a carrot so yeah, yeah that which was makes which gives people more flexibility to um to work when they want to work in the working day you know that works for them and work around some of the, the needs that life just has and uh you know so long as they deliver the outcome that's needed you know why should we care how they do that um unless you know there are obviously circumstances where that's not possible you know you can't build a house that way for example no, no, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah and uh, and obviously you have to collaborate in teams and and, and work in a, in a structure that works for teams but you know I, I get the general point so just sort of moving from from Montessori then and, and that basic um philosophy that you've outlined into sort of the four themes in your book so you know why how can we be happier in the workplace sophie i'd love to know <laughs> tell me the secret well there's a lot of science behind happiness first of all so i'll just say that because as a when i was training to be a chief happiness officer even i felt a little bit like oh is this going to be a little bit too pink and fluffy um, but actually, there's so much science and academia now behind happiness in the workplace. And so what a lot of the studies have found is that there are kind of four main constructs that create a happier workplace. The first one, well, actually, I'll give it to you as a as something you may remember. We call it RP squared in the in the CHO community, in the chief happiness of community. It's known as RP squared. So you've got two R's. I know, I know figuratively, mathematically, it's not correct, but it's got a good buzz to it, hasn't it? So the first so is it R, R squared P or RP squared? It's it's RP squared. So mathematically, it's not quite correct, but you know, people might remember it. Um, so the first R is relationships. And I think this is partly going back to Simon, what you were saying around the water cooler moments, you know, the coffee machine chats. This is incredibly integral in our way of working so of course there does need to be some social interaction we can't go spending you know every month sat on our computers not having any face-to-face -face in real life conversations with people it's just not practical to do that but there is a real need for people to have a sense of belonging and a sense of bonding with people at work having friendships at work having a sense of psychological safety so there's trust so they can speak up and share what's on their mind that is a massive facet to the relationships piece. The second R is around results. So that is fundamentally around knowing that you are contributing to something in some way. But I think there's nothing more soul destroying to go do a job where you don't see the impact of your presence. That makes people solely unhappy. So to know that whether you are popping into sweep a uh, kitchen floor and knowing that the next people that go in there are going to have a, a nice, safe, clean environment to work in, or you're the chief executive who, you know, of a, a large scale organization who's put in you know, a rocket on the moon, there needs to be some sense of what you are doing on a day to day basis is producing a result to someone somewhere you're in service. So that's the first two R's. Then your P, uh, the first one is around play. So play being um, very much something which can be um, conversational play, laughing, joking, you know, having a little bit of banter with people. But this also comes back to one of the references I make in my TED talk, because I talk about three areas, freedom, curiosity, and play is the third one in my TED talk. And that's around actually, if we don't step into play, then how can we possibly create? How can we innovate? How can we break things down and see that something's wrong and needs an innovative new steer on something if we don't step into play? And so one of the things that I do in my workplace culture consultancy is when there's big strategy stuff that needs to happen, 
I put those teams into a play state and we sit and we play with Lego. We create Lego villages to try and articulate where we think the organisation should be going, what we should be doing, how we feel about that. Because the 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 use of kinesthetic interaction when we're playing, so actually using something physical as well as using that intellect, then starts to create a much more collaborative, creative result. So key is play. I think most people would agree to go to work and not have that that jokiness or to not have a sense of banter with someone, to not be able to play with something, tinker with something, break something down, for that to be missing um, would probably cause a sense of unhappiness. So it's quite key that play is there. Life's far too short not to have fun. Right, exactly that, Simon, exactly. And I think what we do in organisations is we engineer out fun. We've become so focused on strategy and being, you know, this being solely focused on this tunnel vision that we've forgotten actually as human beings in our most intrinsic version of ourselves, that play is critically important. And it's how it's how our intelligence first sparked as as young children was free, free play. And we have educated that out. And so now I'm calling upon organisations to bring that back in because those that do and I have a very high play threshold are some of the most successful companies that we we see in this current day. And the final P um, is around purpose. So that goes beyond um, results. That is really knowing that you are playing a result. You're, you're giving something back to society. There is an in embedded need in the organization which is questioning why are we here why are we doing what we're doing how do we contribute so a sense of us being able to completely see a wider purpose in what we're doing so irrespective of whether that's you know picking bananas in the jungle or that is you know you're a finance manager you're an fd who's looking at the figures of the organization knowing that in some way shape or form you are supporting the needs of humanity there is something that you're doing that is serving a greater purpose beyond yourself and beyond your organization so that's the, the i guess the the scientific academic background to happiness um and i stand by all four of those words i think they're all critically important and when I go into organisations and I do workplace culture diagnostics, they are the four critical things that I'm really looking for to see. Is that coming through in their performance management systems? Is that coming through in their leadership style, in their communications, in how, how they deliver learning and development? Am I seeing these four facets happening? And if they're not, then that's my role to then give them some support and guidance on how to bring that, how to bring that in from a happiness perspective. Very interesting. If performance management systems, that could also be a topic of a whole nother podcast. <laughs> I know I said it and then my toes curl that I said it. But um, yeah, that's, that's definitely. So don't worry, we won't we won't go down that rabbit hole today. <laughs> maybe maybe a, a part two, uh, Simon, on that front. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's um, I like that RP squared. So it's RP in brackets squared because of two <laughs> of each of them. Yeah, that that possibly works mathematically so so sophie then moving on to the healthier part so those mm. are the four components you've talked about the rp squared four components of mm. happiness yeah purpose obviously linking into your your fourth theme as well yeah but um tell me about the the healthier part how, healthier. how do we be healthier at work okay so this all started for me when i was a hr and workplace culture director so six years ago now and i left that job and started my consultancy and I was sat on the fifth floor of my office and uh, looking out two o'clock in the afternoon, which is not too dissimilar to the time we're recording this. So I'll see if this is happening for you as well, Simon. But normally around two o'clock, um, there'd be a mass rush onto the fifth floor where the vendor machines were, people desperately vying for that caffeine shot, for that chocolate bar, for those crisps, you know, something to give them some sustenance to get them through the rest of the day because their energy levels have become so depleted. And you can, I guess you can often walk around the office now, if you're in the workplace and you're listening to this now, go walk around at two o'clock in the afternoon and see what people's posture looks like. You know, people have got their heads in their hands. They're kind of staring, like just staring at the screen thinking, oh my gosh, <laughs> how do I survive the next three or four hours with these levels of, uh, of energy? And so I started noticing that. And I also started noticing muscular skeletal issues with people. So from a HR perspective, lots of people going off sick with stress, going off sick with um, RSI, so repetitive strain injury, 
back problems. And I thought, wow, what are we doing to contribute towards that in terms of people's nutrition, in terms of taking care of their bodies? So I talk about well-being. Obviously, mental health is a is a critically important element here. But I think your audience probably know enough about that for me to not step into that space. And I think to add value to this conversation, I'm going to talk about the physical side now rather than the mental side. And I I strongly believe and I saw this so much through COVID that what we don't do is prepare ourselves to have um, a ritual for starting up our day and a ritual for closing down our day. So when it comes to well-being, it's about how am I fueling my body for the day ahead? What am I physically putting in my body to give me the energy to be able to sustain and get through the the meetings I have? You know, some of them, for some of us, they're back to back to back to back. Um, How am I going to find that energy to keep myself sharp, to keep myself, you know, ahead of the game, performing, being able to spark off with people and, and give the right responses? That all comes from your energy. And if you're not putting the right things into your body, you're going to really struggle to maintain that throughout the working day. So because of that, um, I trained as a nutritionist and equally I trained as a yoga teacher as well to try and shift some of the kind of musculoskeletal stuff that I was seeing in the workplace. So I go into organisations now and I help them understand what that power up ritual needs to look like for their people. And equally, the closing down ritual, which I think is critically important when we're working from home, especially. I don't, make, don't know about you, Simon, but for most people, the only differentiation when they're working from home that their working day is finished is they close down the laptop lid. And if we were commuting, we would have some decompression time. We'd have, I mean, my commute was two hours, so I had a fair decompression time. But for some people, it might be a 20 minute walk. It might be a cycle. It might be a, you know, a hop on the tube. But whatever that was, there was time for you to kind of download the day's events to kind of think about leaving them somewhere, parking them somewhere, sending a memo to yourself about the things you forgot to do. And then you can prepare yourself before you walk through the front door to to greet your family, your cat, your partner, you know, whoever it is you you live with or you don't live with, but ready to walk through that door to be Sophie Bryan as the individual, not Sophie Bryan as the employee. And I think we really harmed ourselves during COVID. And I think we're still continuing to do that now, those of us that are working from home, by not creating that switching off ritual so that we can be the best we can be in our home lives, the people that we love and have around us, rather than staying in this energetic space, which is our work. So again, a lot of the work I do there is helping people in organisations to create a culture of a closing down ritual so that people can go home to their families in the best shape they possibly can, because that's also a big struggle for people when they can't show up for their families in the way that they'd like to. So, yeah, I'm taking it from a slightly different perspective, I guess, to perhaps what you'd probably hear from regards no, to... I think I, there's a lot there. I mean, I, I uh, 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 one of my previous employers actually introduced me to this idea of the importance of, of mental health, of physical health and of nutrition. Mm. Um, by sending me on a course, I couldn't believe it. I was... I was um, actually sent on a course where I think I participated in a yoga class I had a massage you know all on company time Mm -hmm. which was quite incredible but it was actually probably one of the best courses I've ever done um, because it really was about it was the firm saying to me and to everyone else on the course as senior leaders in the firm Mm -hmm. um, you know if you don't look after yourself you will not be able to perform uh, in the job and you won't be setting the right role model Mm -hmm. Uh, for other people in the firm Mm -hmm. Um, and it's incredibly important and I think I I mean for me personally COVID has been a a great blessing in the sense that I've I've had the space to to get healthy you know so I've really you know actually got into much more of an exercise routine Um, I'm I've I've you know changed the way I eat Um, and you know I'm I'm in a much better space Um, you know but lucky me and I think one of the things that I learned on that course, which I'm getting better at applying now, but which isn't easy, mm-hmm. is this idea that you have to schedule health into your diary. And I actually love that, you know, because mm-hmm. it's so easy to get carried away with work. Um, and particularly when you don't have that startup and shutdown schedule uh, or, or um, mechanism when you're working from home. 
um, you know, and, and you can easily find that the day just disappears and you don't have time to look after yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so this idea that it's actually good to schedule time into diet to look after yourself, I think is a, has been, has been a sort of a slightly transforming thing for me. Um, but anyway, so th there's so much in that theme of <laughs> yeah. health and how to be healthy. And I would encourage our listeners, if you're not in good health, if you're not exercising regularly, if you're not eating well and you're not feeling great and you have that dip in the afternoon, um, you really need to do something about it, um, mm. you know, for, the, for your own sake, as well as, as those around you. Mm. Um, right. How to be more productive, which kind of leads on to from from both of those two themes. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe touches on, I saw, I saw Julian had a question about, um, you know, do, do performance reviews actually aid happiness or, or dilute happiness? And, and perhaps that's linked to this idea of how, how you're more productive. Mm. Um, because I do think how you're measured, how your performance is measured does impact quite significantly on how productive you are. Let's take it as a given that you need yeah. to be happy and be doing the things that you've talked about for happiness and you need to be mm -hmm. healthy. Um, how, how can we be more productive and, and what role does performance management play in that? Okay, well, <laughs> this is a real passion subject for me. So I'll, I'll try and keep some brevity to this because I, I will I will bring so much into this answer. But I think that the short of it, especially in regards to Julian's question around performance and that being linked, you know, performance reviews being linked into workplace happiness, I'll ask you this question, Simon. Have you ever been excited about walking into an appraisal? <laughs> no. Have I you think ever, is the short, I, I know is the short answer. I, I always walk into a performance review knowing, you know, knowing within myself whether it's going to be a good one, a bad one, or an indifferent one. Mm -hmm. um, have I ever been excited about it? No, it's, it's sort of like a necessary evil in the right. corporate world that you have to endure. And it's the same, I would ask the same question as a leader around, have you have you ever felt excited and joyful and happy about giving a performance review? I have, yes. Oh, <laughs> <I> have. <laughs> that's nice to I hear. Have, because there's nothing that makes me happier <laughs> than telling somebody that they're going to be promoted, mm. for example. Um, and and particularly, um, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've had a focus in my career on helping women particularly to get promoted mm, because nice. often it's a lot harder for them um, and they have to, you know, the, the firms seem to set the bar just so much higher and they have to jump through so many more hoops. So, yes, I've always enjoyed going into performance review where I can give that news mm. um, and actually where I've been able to have a conversation with a person about you're doing brilliantly, you're making such a positive impact um and and you know let's talk about even better riff but yeah. you you and i i think talked about this previously um sophie is this idea i, I quite like this um idea of uh marcus buckingham's going mm. sort of back a few Thanks years strengths. yeah strengths finder you know mm. playing to your strengths um and and we know the research shows that people who build on their strengths rather than try to mm. develop their problem areas actually, yeah. you know, get a much bigger return. So perhaps you could say something about that. Yeah, well, I think firstly, um, it was the Corporate Leadership Council that did some research on the back of Marcus Buckingham's findings around um, strengths. And they found that when people play to their strengths, they increase performance by 39%. Yes. Yet when you ask someone to play to their weaknesses, which is what we do in performance reviews, we're like, Simon, you're doing amazing here, 10 out of 10 across the board, but ah, this thing here, ah, we need to see some improvement. It's, on not only, it's not only in the, in the reviews. You know, sometimes we ask people in the role they're doing. Oh, absolutely! It, to play it, to to their weaknesses, and and one happening. of my key passions is is helping people align their strength with the role that they're actually doing, because mm -hmm. I think that's key to happiness as well. But when you do that, you are when you're asking people to play to their weaknesses, and um, the research found that you decrease performance by twenty seven percent. And yeah. so you can either elevate someone's strength on what they're really great at and see quite an exponential increase in performance. Yes. Or you can push people to be a square peg in a round hole, try and force them to be gifted at something they're not gifted at 
and you will see their performance decrease. And I think there's so much to be said around job design here. And this is one of, again, another one of my big bugbears is how we create roles in organisations. So you will be expected, and I always use the example of a finance director, because in every organisation I've worked with FDs, I see this playing out continuously in that you have to be incredibly gifted with number with analytics, being able to see a spreadsheet and be able to tell a narrative from those numbers what is going on in the organisation and put those red flags, those amber flags, those green flags in place, whatever they are. That requires a very analytical, technically minded, very academic background to be able to do that. What I often see in that same circumstance is someone who is analytical, which also applies to the likes of engineers, um, people that work, you know, computer software engineering, that type of thing, um, very analytical, very engineered based minds also being asked to not just be in their technical role, but be in a people based role as well. So not only have you got to be great at the number and the techniques, whatever that specialist area is, you also got to be amazing at handling people, the psychology of people, the dynamics of people, the com deep complexity of what it is to be a human. You've got, to be an, you've got to be an expert in that space too. And what you're asking us to do when you design job descriptions like that is almost impossible. I mean, there are some people who can step into technical and people very well, but there are many, many people who are either one or the other. I love doing the people bit. I love being a people manager, but I'm not so good at the technical stuff. Or I love doing the technical stuff, but please don't promote me to be a manager because I don't want to deal with the people bit. And this is actually a very real reality for me with my husband in that he was an engineer working in a factory. And because he was so good at handling the machines and being able to problem solve what was going on and getting people to rally around and showing them what to do when things went wrong, he then got promoted to being the team supervisor, which then meant he was responsible for dealing with bereavements, sickness, absence, people not turning up to work. And that was not an area of his expertise whatsoever. And yet he was pushed into that space through promotion. And so what I think we need to do is really redefine the way we design jobs in that we create roles that are very much technically minded and allow those people that are gifted in that technical space to really absorb themselves in that space, be the best they can be, immerse themselves in that knowledge and that experimentation of that knowledge in that space. And the people that are really gifted with conversation, with coaching, holding space for people, motivating people, let them step into that space. But let's not try and create a world where we have to be both, because for so many people, that doesn't exist. And we are we are really we're breaking people by asking them to do that. So, uh, yeah, I feel there needs to be some delineation in how we design our jobs and even our structures in our organisation. Mm. Yeah, so and recognize so so in, just to summarize, to be more productive, we need to help people align who they are with Absolutely. the role that we're asking them to perform. Yeah. And recognize that it's not a one size fits all. Mm. Um and in, in Conferry, we talk a lot about personas. It's quite helpful when you're designing career architectures yeah. to think about personas um mm. in that so that you can help to sort of bring that that differentiation in. Um, right. And what I'd, so, what, I'd yeah. also, what I'd also quickly just say on that, Simon, as well, is that you need to think about the dynamics of your team. So if you have got lots of technical expertise in the team and you need someone to be the team leader, then you need to think about the whole team as a whole and going, right, what gifts and skills have we got here and what's missing? When we recruit someone in, we need to recruit for the thing that's missing. Find someone who's got that strength in that space rather than trying to rejig things and make it fit for people. I think if you can see it from that perspective as a team construct of what needs to be done and how you're playing to everyone's strengths, then that is when the team as a whole also becomes productive and not just individuals. Yeah, fully agree, fully agree. Just conscious of time. I think that brings us nicely to to the last the last theme with purpose, purpose. which is a good a good one to uh, kind of mm. conclude the discussion on. Mm. So why why is purpose so important, Sophie? Well, I think it goes back to what I was saying before that everybody needs to know they're contributing to something. 
and you're intrinsic. But we're not, but we're not all contributing. So this is this is the challenge, I think, in this area because mm. lots of people talk about purpose, mm. and we'd all love to think that we're contributing to the betterment of of humankind. Um, but in the reality, we might be contributing to making a widget <laughs> that goes in onto the shelf somewhere, mm. you know, mm. uh, or into into an online store. So how 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 can we make it a bit more concrete for mm. people rather than sort of a very mm. fuzzy, you know, well, for the benefit of humankind kind of concept? Well, even if it's not that, it doesn't have to be for the benefit of humankind. But, you know, even with the widget that's going, you're, you're creating the widget that's going into the car or going into the thing that's on the, 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 the store shelf, whatever it is, that it's serving a purpose in some way. Whether, whether you're creating a, a cleaning solution to clean your desk with or you're, you know, you're creating an electric car, there is still a purpose behind, there's still a why. You're still meeting a need or a question that is like, how can we make this thing better or do this thing that means that your role exists? But to put it into a practical context um, around purpose and how organisations go around creating that narrative and getting people on board with that purpose is very much about, obviously, the mission statement of the organisation and how that feeds into the values and behaviours of the organisation. But the critical thing for me here around that is that it is not the board or the C-suite that creates those values. It's the organisation at large that creates those values. If you are in an organization where, you know, you get a communication Monday morning. So great news. The board and the C-suite have, have been de debilitated, you know, deliberating, sorry, over the past couple of months about the new values. And here they are. Like now go off and be respectful, go off and be honest and now be collaborative. And we're here's the email that says go do those things, which I have seen happen. I can't tell you. In and things. we've decided your purpose is. Dot, yes, dot, dot. right. Yeah, yeah. And we've made that decision for you. And we're just telling you, right, from today onwards, Simon, please go be honest. Please go be respectful. And please go be collaborative. Off you go. You've got no buying. You've got no emotional attachment to that. You have no sense of purpose behind those words or those values. And a lot of my culture change work is going into organizations where they've done that and gone, but that's our culture and it's just not changing. <laughs> I was like, well, the reason is because you have not enlisted the people in that creation of your purpose, in that creation of your values. So what you need to be doing to create that sense of purpose and that enlistment of why you are at work doing the thing you're doing, even if it feels like the most menial thing, the way you go about doing that is you ask the organization, what do you think is critically important about what we do? What behaviours do you think we need to have in order for us to continue being the best we are at this particular thing? And then you start using the words that your people select, not the convoluted words that you in the boardroom or the C-suite have decided, but the actual words of your people. So for some people, you could say, right, transparency is one of our values. And that's a really big part of how we develop our product. But some people may have absolutely no emotional connection to the word transparency whatsoever. What that word might mean for them is clear. Mm. Let's be clear. And in which case, if you use a word that your staff have given you, they voted on, there's been focus groups about, there's been a real clear understanding of what does that word mean? What does it look like in our jobs? How can we be clear? In what circumstances are we clear? Once you, Your staff are going to do all that work for you. They have all this knowledge, incredible amount of knowledge that you don't see. There's um, there's the iceberg of ignorance, which talks about people in the C-suite only see 4% of the problems in the organisation. And then your people see 100% of the problems. So if you're engaging with them and asking them, they're going to be giving you everything you need to know. They're a goldmine of information. So that purpose thing has to be driven by the employee voice. Of course, you need to rationalize that with the strategy, where it's going, what do we need to become? But if you aren't using your employees' words to convey that purpose, you're going to struggle to get them on board and for them to relate to why it's important. You make that widget that goes into that box that goes and sits on that store shelf because they haven't got that emotional connection. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. Again, in the context of culture change in Corn Ferry, we call that movement making. 
you know, how do you create a, a movement to create the culture change? Mm. Um, and and there's quite a helpful concept as well, I think, around the tipping point. You know, so if you can mm. enlist enough employees and get that voice of the employee in creating the movement, mm. uh, it's surprising. Our research shows you only need about ten percent of a company to um, yeah. embrace the new, um, you know, embrace their own definition of. Of values and purpose mm. to uh, to create that movement, and then it sort of becomes viral. Mm. Um, fascinating stuff, Sophie. I think I think we're out of time, but yeah. thank you so much. It's been really great talking to you and, and hearing all about how. I think I think people should have a pretty good idea from from this podcast of what, about some of the key ingredients mm. for health and well being in the workplace and. Mm. Um, very interesting uh, listening to you uh, and talking with you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been a joy.